All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, excited to be with you on today. I know there is a lot going on in the world, which doesn't really say much because that's always the case, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, about three months ago, uh, we talked about this notion of kingdom investment. <clears throat> And specifically, we honed in on the fact that kingdom investment is a slow growth opportunity, right? We reviewed the biblical story arc to try to better understand, well, where are we exactly in this movie? And we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, we're probably in the end, whether it's the beginning of the end, the middle of the end, or the end of the end is to be determined. We also ask, well, you know, where does the kingdom lie? Where is the kingdom? And so we learned that initially when it came to the nation of Israel, uh, kind of in the beginning of the biblical canon, uh, if you will, or in terms of history and what God wants to do in and through the earth, uh, it was an eruption. That's I-R-R option, right, where it was breaking in from the outside. And so God chooses the nation of Israel to kind of be his ambassadors and to show the world what it means to be in relationship with him. But now it's an eruption, E-R, eruption, that is breaking out from the inside. And in fact, uh, it erupts from within believers. So don't be surprised when you read the Gospels and Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is among you or in the midst of you or is in you. And that's what I like to suppose is that the kingdom is actually within us, not in totality. Right. Uh, but these are spiritual things. So um, sometimes it's hard to find, you know, direct parallels in the language uh, that is appropriate to really get the point across. But I, I think you you get where I'm coming from. Just a reminder, if a kingdom does not touch any and everything, it's a kingdom that will soon be overthrown. God's kingdom will involve social political, geographical, art, agricultural, architectural, artistic, technological, and animal elements. Uh, so when Jesus says he is making all things new, he means all things, right? Not just some things or the things we prefer. So in fact, the kingdom is here and it is advancing, but its full manifestation is still to come. And so we kind of ended on this note that, OK, you've convinced me, Brother Marcus, things are changing around here, but it is a slow process. So in the meantime, what else can we understand about the kingdom and its arrival? Well, today we will learn about another aspect of kingdom investment namely how to understand the arrival of the kingdom and so here i was able to uh, uh find this at my local record store this is actually uh the album cover of jesus's next mixtape entitled kingdom investment 2 the arrival jesus preaches the message of the kingdom not in word alone but with deed and power before sending out his disciples, Jesus briefs them on their mission. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. The disciples could believe they would fulfill the teacher's mandate because they saw him accomplish these very things. Complimenting Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom were the signs of healing and exorcism. He was one of many during his time who could perform such feats. However, the degree to which he did set him apart from his peers. Now, according to uh, Nicholas Perrin in his book, The Kingdom of God, A Biblical Theology, he suggests the threefold nature of healings, ex exorcisms, and proclamation actually points to an ever-present theme throughout the biblical text and this theme is return from exile and new creation return from exile and new creation uh, so parents suggest that healings exorcisms 
and proclamation of the kingdom message, which is the gospel, are actually present signs of the kingdom. When Jesus sends word back to John the Baptizer to address if he is the one everyone has been waiting for, he uses imagery found in the book of Isaiah. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blesses anyone who takes no offense at me. This imagery, according to Perrin, speaks to exile and states matter-of-factly to John and any other witnesses to Jesus' words and actions that Israel is coming out of exile. This messianic king fulfills God's purposes for dealing with evil and brings Israel its long-awaited freedom from the Roman government, though in ways not previously anticipated by most. You have to remember um, that in the minds of the Israelites, freedom from the Roman government meant a new uh, tangible and physical government, one of this world uh, and not one from outside of this world. So return from exile and new creation. Sign number one, healings. The blind see. So in Mark chapter 10, we have a story of blind Barnabas. Let's jump to that. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Next, the lame walk. Right, We have the story of the healing of a paralytic in Matthew chapter 9. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say stand up and walk? But, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. Next example of sign number one, the lepers are cleansed. And remember, it was not one, but ten. The deaf hear and the dumb speak. That's found in Mark chapter 7. And then perhaps everybody's favorite story, the dead are raised. Lazarus lives again. John chapter 11. Healing and new creation are represented by Jesus's ministry of restoration for the disabled within Israel to creational wholeness. Pair notes that Jesus is acting out a parable for restoring spiritual disabled Israel as a whole. So let me back up. Um, Jesus, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about how Jesus kind of represents this new humanity, right? And if you remember from our series on prophecy, it's often that the prophet uh, ends up 
living or experiencing certain situations that represents uh, something on a, a greater whole, a, a larger scale, if you will. And so we see that in the life of Jesus, uh, many things that he did or experienced that actually uh, represent um, ideas of cosmic proportions, if you will. So in particular, as it relates to healing and new creation, um, his ministry of restoration for those who were disabled within Israel, he was bringing them back to what we'll note as creational wholeness. Um, another example of this, you may remember that in, Gen in Genesis, the kingdom functioned based on mediation, right? So there was somebody who was acting as an ambassador on behalf of the actual king. And they were doing so under the image-bearing priest king, Adam. So Adam was charged with protecting uh, that which was in Eden. Uh, specifically, I suggested that he was protecting against the evil that was lurking outside of the sacred space, but fell. And so, as a result of disobedience of Adam and Eve, both sin and death enter. Uh, however, Jesus, who's known as the last Adam, a representative of a new humanity, is now inviting witnesses to join him in this new way of being human. So, in fact, Jesus is the first example of humanity's recreation, in a sense. All right, so we have sign number two, um, exorcisms. The first example uh, is the, the men in tombs in Matthew chapter 8. Um, so in some of the Gospels, it says it was just one man. Uh, in Matthew, it says it was two men. And this was after Jesus and the disciples, you know, take the boat to the other side. They step out and uh, this man or these men run and start having this conversation with Jesus. And then eventually all of the demons end up in the pigs. Uh, we have the boy with an unclean spirit in Mark chapter 9. So let's jump to that. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them. You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you were able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, This kind can come out only through prayer. Another example of uh, exorcism as you had a woman who was bent over for 18 years, found in Luke chapter 13. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you were set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, Immediately, she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. 
Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing in all the wonderful things that he was doing. And then lastly, in terms of our second science, which is exorcism, we have Mary Magdalene and many others uh, who Jesus healed of diseases um, and whatever destruction they may have been experiencing as a result of what we'll call the work of the devil. Return from exile. Uh, Return from exile shows up constantly during Jesus's exorcism of demonic spirits from individuals and the Jewish religiosity which opposed him. So we're talking about the the temple establishment, right? The religious leaders of the day. Last time we discussed the development of the messianic concept. And it just so happens that before Jesus's time physically on earth, Jewish interest in the demonic realm increase, which heavily influenced their ideas concerning the coming Messiah. Now, this is evidenced in part by what's known as apocalyptic literature. So when we talk about Revelation, when we talk about uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, and many others um, that are not necessarily found in our typical canon, right? Our typical Protestant book of 66 books, Old Testament and New Testament combined. Um, within apocalyptic literature, uh, the story tends to hinge on a battle between the Messiah and his team of angels overcoming the long-standing problem of Israel's demonic oppression, right? So you see that, especially at the end of Daniel, um, I want to say it's chapter 11, 12-ish, uh, where there's this battle that's uh, going to take place. There's, there's discussion of overcoming uh, these forces of evil that have been oppressing the people. And we see the same thing uh, within the book of Revelation, right? Uh, even though at that point in time it was more so New Testament believers, same concept. Countless power encounters with the demonic tend to corroborate Jesus' kingdom message. The warrior king Jesus depicts through these sign acts Israel's cleansing from sin, as well as the banishment of idols, false prophets, and impurity. Undoubtedly, these were the signs the prophet Zechariah understood to be hallmarks of the kingdom's inbreaking and evidence of God's triumph over chaos, referring back to Genesis. So here we have Zechariah uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. On that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also, I will remove from the land and the prophet. I, remove, I will remove from the land the prophets and the unclean spirit. And so here it's talking about false prophets, not the ones who actually uh, uh, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, and those who speak the actual words of God. And then uh, a chapter later in Zechariah 14, verse 9, it says, And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So now we have our final sign, which is proclamation of the gospel or the kingdom message, right? And the poor have good news brought to them coming out of Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy. For in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Not only 
does the poor have good news brought to them. Um, in fact, it is Jesus, at least initially, proclaiming this good news, which we see in Mark chapter 1 and all throughout the Gospels. Another instance of proclamation is when the Canaanite mother begs for crumbs from the table found in Matthew chapter 15. And it's a really interesting exchange, especially given um, the cultural realities back then in terms of um, not only interactions between men and women, uh, but also we'll say the Jewish people or the Israelites and those who were uh, outside of their uh, family, as it will. So it reads, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. And then I have here uh, Jesus leveling the playing field, where in Luke chapter 6, he comes down um, and is basically at eye level with the, the crowd, as I understand it, which we know Jesus was often to do. He, he wasn't just, uh, you know, up, up in the, uh, the pulpit, if you will, with the space between him and, and the people he sought to minister to, but was actually found to be among the people. Lastly, Perrin points to Jesus' proclamation to the poor in connection with return from exile and new creation. Jesus prefers the poor. His announcement of a righteous and just kingdom is good news to those who are the first to become marginalized or overlooked as those in power and with wealth and status become comfortable even amid corruption. Jesus' solidarity with those on the margins reflects his understanding that he is the herald of this good news to those faithful destined to return from exile paralleled in Isaiah. It also signifies that he must take center stage as the eschatological high priest, remitting all debts and returning all land holdings to their rightful own owners per the law, which is Torah. So um, for those who this may be a new concept for um, according to Torah, right, which is some of the teachings of the Old Testament, specifically the first five books, um, among others, is that every so often all debts were to be forgiven, right? So you have this uh, idea called the year of Jubilee, as well as all land holdings were to be returned uh, to their rightful owners. And we've had many uh, other messages that touch on those things. So your takeaways uh, for today. Well, first, uh, return from exile and new creation is a theme throughout the Bible. Also, healings, exorcism, and proclamation of the gospel are signs of the kingdom. And so I would encourage you uh, to look and see where those signs are present in and around you and your life. Um, and if you are not seeing those signs, um, maybe just have a talk with God and see where he leads you. Jesus' proclamation of the gospel to the poor highlighted his hearers' destiny based on their identity. An identity can simultaneously be who you are based on who you'll become. So I'll say that again. An identity can, at the same time, be who you are based on who you will become. Those who were disobedient idol worshipers would experience judgment and subjugation, whereas the soon-to-be enfranchised poor, because they were previously disenfranchised, or the people of God, 
that were headed to restoration and co-rule with God. Uh, next up, exile is a part of life. And these are my, my thoughts. Uh, exiles are not for God to teach us a lesson, so to speak, but rather to remind us of what we should already know. Know in terms of who God is and who we are, what God has done and what God will do through us. So we may find ourselves exiled in isolation or cut off from certain people, places and situations or circumstances. We should not automatically assume a posture of guilt and think that we are in this place because of, this, of a decision we have made or sin that was committed. It may in fact be tied to what the Lord is doing and wants to do in our lives. Uh, now, we are not absolving uh, responsibility and accountability necessary for the decisions that we make and how we live our lives, uh, but we're also not running to say, why is this happening to me? The Lord must be punishing me, all right? So like a good parent, the Lord allows us at times to experience the consequences of our actions, but his desire for us is good alone. And then last, but certainly not least, we are new creatures because we are in Christ. So in closing, when it comes to kingdom investment, we must grasp that it takes time. But we also must be aware of the signs accompanying the arrival of the kingdom. These signs include, but are not limited to, healings, exorcism, and proclamation of the kingdom message, which is the gospel. It is through these signs that Jesus is reordering creation. Jesus also challenges the church to participate in this reordering of creation. If we want Jesus to come home, we must do our part. More on that next time.